All righty. You're all set on my end. I'll mute myself again. Thank you, Darrell. All right, so it looks like we're one minute past 10 o'clock. Um, we won't get started just yet. I'm gonna go through and do a count of the um, FEIC representatives on file just to make sure that we have quorum. One second, hold on. Um, hold on. All right, make sure I'm not zapped. Amner, Casey, Kylie, Pesky, Land, We're going to give it a few more minutes. We need a few additional members on board before we can get started. Great, we've got Julia. Transmitting guard. All right, I'm going to do a quick recount to make sure that we've got above half. One, two, three, four, five, six, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. All right, everyone. My name is Darrell Hughes. I'm the designated federal officer of the Fruit and Vegetable Industry Advisory Committee. Um, which is chaired by Paul Lightfoot, who is our chair who's online. Um, this is day two of the meeting. And um, 
we, we have held public comments yesterday, which will be recorded on the video. Um, today, it's really it's going to be a lot of work um, reviewing the remaining um, two subcommittee recommendations and even hearing a presentation from our market news data colleagues. Um, and so with that, I think we can just sort of, uh, I will state that quorum has been met and, and so we can get started with um, calling the meeting to order. And I will give the floor over to Tom Lepetsky, who is the lead of our um, subcommittee on climate and infrastructure. And I'll get the presentation queued up for you right now, Tom. Okay, great. Thanks, Darrell. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just want to start with a quick thanks to our uh, committee members, uh, David Zaff, uh, George Hamner, Michael Janis, Don Zia, and Paul White. But they did a tremendous amount of work on these couple of recommendations. And I'll be happy to share those with you this morning. The focus of our subcommittee was really on recommendations for policies and programs pertaining to how infrastructure investment and carbon sequestration could be advantageous to the fruit and vegetable industry. The first of our recommendations arises from really the convergence of two conversations that are taking place across our country. Those being a desire to drive increased sustainability in our agricultural and food systems and the current debate around uh, infrastructure funding. When many think of infrastructure, the top of mind reaction is to think of roads, highways, bridges, airports, and other structural elements. As such, our subcommittee felt it important that USDA specify and highlight food in this conversation and believe that aligning the simple yet powerful word of food with infrastructure um, allows for a more specific and purposeful terminology to help resonate and provide clarity to policymakers in all the varying constituencies. With that as some background, our first recommendation is for the secretary to encourage USDA to use the phrase food infrastructure in a more poignant way, providing specific focus, differentiation, and increased visibility to agriculture and food systems within the context of infrastructure. Expanding this understanding and awareness beyond roads and highways to farming and food distribution requires this level of detail. If the food sector is to resonate in current and future public funding initiatives aimed at strengthening and expanding infrastructure. So the second recommend, recommendation we have this morning recognizes that greener, new technologies are continually being developed. However, many of these technologies that could enable producers to reduce their environmental impact remain unused or underutilized. For example, incorporation of hot seal packaging can reduce overall plastic use as compared to traditional clamshell packaging. And there are others relating to irrigation efficiency and precision application of crop protectants that remain unused or underutilized. In the absence of market demands, there are often not the economic incentives necessary to encourage producers to make these capital investments in newer green technologies or existing less environmental mentally friendly technologies are either already in place or require less initial investment. So increasing grant funding for this purpose would likely sway decision makers to invest in environmentally preferable options and additional funding would surely enable more producers to afford the conversion to newer, likely more efficient production technologies and positively impact their competitiveness. With that as a little background, our second recommendation is for the secretary to increase grant funding for the procurement and fielding of environmentally preferable green technologies directly relating to the growing, harvesting, processing, and packaging of agricultural products. And in doing so, accelerating the implementation and use of more environmentally acceptable technologies and reducing impacts of the agriculture sector to our environment. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of our two recommendations. And with that, I'd now like to turn our screens over to Robert Bonney. Robert is USDA's Senior Advisor to Secretary Vilsack on Climate, and he'll speak to us this morning about climate work at USDA and USDA's ability to develop and or support a national standard for calculating carbon credits. Robert, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Uh, Tom, thanks for, thanks for having me. It's good to be with uh, all of you. Um, 
Why don't I do two things to start off? One, just to give you a general sense of the work we're doing on, um, on climate change. And then second, to uh, kind of react to the two, um, uh, your two recommendations. And then uh, happy to open up and ask, uh, uh, have a conversation around any of the work we're doing and questions you all may have. It's a good conversation starting as we came on about um, carbon, carbon markets. Happy to um, talk about that stuff as well. So, um, you know, when it comes to climate change, obviously a very high priority for the secretary, very high priority for the department. In May, I think it was, we put out a, a report um, in response to President Biden's EO on the strategy that USDA would be using around uh, climate smart agriculture and forestry. Um, most importantly is that this is going to be incentive based, it's going to be voluntary, it's going to be about partnerships, it's going to be about working with producers to find tools that work, work for them, that work for landowners, uh, and that we build those tools together and that we um, create new opportunities, new markets, um, not only to address issues related to mitigating greenhouse gases, but also to think about the tools that producers and landowners need to address the, the effects of climate change. Um, so that's sort of the broad theme. We're, you know, we're looking at our existing programs, our farm bill programs, how can we do better to, um, um, to target climate smart agriculture and forestry. Um, we're looking at, at investing in data and outreach and making sure we've got, we've, we've got good science here, good research but also that we do a good job of measuring and monitoring um, uh, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions and that we, we, we make investments there as well. Um, um, and so, you know, really looking at the, the, uh, all the programs we have and how they can be yet best used to serve agriculture and um, serve uh, climate change at the same time. We've already started to, um, uh, to move some dollars in EQIP and, and, and some other programs towards uh, climate change, expect that, um, expect that to continue. Obviously, a lot of discussion right now around the uh, infrastructure package There's significant uh, dollars in there if it passes to, to help um, fund climate smart agriculture and forestry through our uh, traditional conservation programs. Uh, and so, um, uh, if that passes, you know, working in partnership with folks out in the field um, is going to be really, really important in, in deploying those resources. The other thing I mentioned is that um, in late September, the, the um, secretary made a, um, uh, gave a speech at Colorado State University, um, uh, talked about many of the things uh, USDA is doing related to climate change. One of the things he talked about is a new Climate Smart Partnership initiative. As part of that speech, he, he uh, noted that we were releasing a request for information on uh, that potential new initiative. The, the public comment period has just um, ended on that. We've gotten a lot of good comments. But the idea behind that initiative is to partner with agriculture and forestry in commodity production and to um, finance the essentially finance the production of climate smart commodities, um, both in deploying climate smart practices for producers to be able to de-risk some of those things, to pick up the costs of, of some of those climate smart uh, practices, and then as well to help uh, finance the measurement, monitoring, and verification of those. All tied to commodity production. This is about producing commodities um, using climate smart agriculture and forestry, and then measuring the, the climate impacts whether producers want to produce a carbon credit or maybe they want to produce a climate smart commodity, um, really up to producers. But the idea here is that groups of producers come forward with projects um, and, and with an approach to both, uh, again, put climate smart agriculture and forestry practices on the ground and then um, uh, create the systems to measure and monitor um, the impacts of those over time. So just gotten the uh, public comments back. We'll be going through them in the um, uh, next couple of weeks. Um, would welcome conversations for from you all um, and others about how to how to make that um, uh, that initiative work for agriculture. Everything we do uh, has to work for agriculture. It's not going to work for the climate. So um, same with this with this initiative. 
Um, you know, and our expectation would be to, to hopefully go out with something in the winter, sort of a request for proposals, and then fund things um, uh, later in the spring. Um, so lo lots of work going on around uh, climate at, at, at USDA um, and really welcome the opportunity to discuss um, uh, your all's ideas and thoughts and recommendations today. Um, on, your, uh, on your two uh, recommendations on uh, uh, food infrastructure, you know, secretary obviously and the deputy secretary engaged uh, heavily in conversations around food systems. So there's a lot of conversation about our food systems, our food infrastructure. Um, the secretary likes to talk about um, nutrition, and so you might uh, you might uh, hear him talk about nutrition infrastructure as part of the conversation around food infrastructure. But obviously, happy to take uh, the recommendation to um, uh, to the secretary um, on the on your second recommendation. Honestly, when I read it, I thought about our Climate Smart Partnership Initiative. I think you're all thinking mirrors that. How do we um, support uh, the, the production of climate smart um, commodities? How do we, how do we de-risk that for producers? How do we, we create new market opportunities there? Feels to me like there may be some, some overlap there. And again, would welcome your all's uh, recommendations on, and thoughts on how we do a better job. So let me, let me stop there and i um, happy to uh, have a conversation, take questions or, or uh, whatever you all would like. Um, All righty. Uh, go ahead, George. Robert, um, question on number seven. One of the things that we, looking at this from broad perspective on my own part, not necessarily the committee, there are products around the world versus products made in the U.S. that actually lend themselves to this. It's not the habit of USDA to support grant money and or projects or, or money for stuff outside the world, but I'm just wondering, is this something we would be a little more broad-minded in? I'm thinking there's a company in Australia, for instance, that does biodegradable plastics. And in as much as we're doing this global reach now, I, how do you feel about global supply versus U.S. supply? I mean, I think our focus for our U.S. programs is going to be on um, uh, U.S. producers and and um, and agriculture here. That's not to say that are, there aren't things that we can't learn. Um, you know, the secretary just announced um, the um, with the government of um, UAE this Aim for Climate initiative, which is about increasing climate change research. Part of the the expectation is there is there's things we can learn from other parts of the country and maybe things they can learn from us as well. So I'm not sure in our Climate Smart Partnership initiative that we're going to be deploying resources internationally, but that doesn't mean there is an interest there and um, opportunities to, um, you know, to, to work with folks around the globe to, um, you know, to put these types of technologies and practices in place. I didn't mean uh deploying money around the world. I was thinking about supporting U.S. producers that have to buy products from around the world. Yeah, I mean, I, um, um, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested in, in learning more about that. The question would be kind of the fit for um, our programs, what authorities we have to be able to do that. I think we'd, we'd obviously be open um, uh, to, you know, we will obviously want to support um, U.S. producers in any way we can. So, um, we just have to think about what it is and 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 what it how it would fit into kind of our existing programs and authorities. Gotcha. Last thing is that on on the carbon credits, I know we've got these new centers we're deploying around the country. We probably need to do as much as we can about explaining carbon credits within our own industries. It's trying to figure out how they work. I was originally asked about maybe USDA coming up with some kind of structure because they don't seem to have a lot of structure to me now, but I think USDA certainly can help educate and continue to educate people. So this is a, this, this is a, it's a really important point and it's a place where you all have um, some real, I think, important uh, input to provide in agriculture more broadly. So okay. As, as you pointed out, I think in the opening um, little back and forth, I think you were pointing out, you know, there's a lot of chaos. There are lots of different standards. Producers don't know uh, which standards. And clearly over time, you, you'd hope to get more certainty and 
sort of coming together of, of what it takes. And you're starting to see a conversation about exactly this is what are, what are the standards that are, are required when you think about whether it's producing a climate smart commodity or a carbon credit or, or whatever it is. And the question um, uh, for, for agriculture, for USDA and for others is what, what role does USDA play? We already provide data for models, for, for other tools that allow producers to understand if they make certain practice changes, what the impacts are both to yields, but also to carbon production and all that. And so there are ways through data and science that USDA is already participating in, in these types of, of markets. The question is how much farther should USDA go in terms of standardization? Do we move, move towards a day in the future where there's actually a, a USDA standard? We're certainly not there yet and not, not contemplating that, but it's, I think it's actually an important um, policy question. If you track the conversation on the Hill about the Growing Climate Solutions Act, part of that is sort of towards standardization to get USDA in the business of certifying technical service providers and others to go out and be able to measure and monitor uh, uh, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions associated with agriculture and forestry. And, and part of that is thinking about what are the standards, what are the methodologies? So it starts to move USDA towards thinking about, you know, what role, again, should we have in, in um, standardizing um, uh, these types of markets and the measurement methodologies around carbon and greenhouse gases? And our Climate Smart Partnership Initiative, as we think about if we put out requests for proposals, we're going to have to define what it is we want in terms of, of kind of broad methodologies. We don't want to be overly prescriptive. We want to allow for creativity, allow for some diversity in how folks do this. But I think over time, you would like to see sort of more convergence about what, what the methodologies and standards are just so that producers have more certainty and they can weigh their um, weigh their options better. So I think we're, we're sort of, you know, this, this conversation about standards and about what role USDA is, is, um, uh, is relatively new. I mean, I've been in this business for, I've been in the uh, sort of policy conversations around agriculture and forestry for a long time. You really see this conversation about standards and potential USDA role pick up in the last six months to a year. And I think this is a place where your all's advisory committee could, could provide some real input because I think, um, I don't think USDA, I don't think we wanna show up on day one and basically say, okay, here's our USDA standard. You know, I think we wanna do this iteratively with agriculture, make sure that whatever is built actually works for producers that we don't set the, the bar on measurement and monitoring so high that it's too expensive for uh, producers to comply. It's got to be cost effective. It's got to work for agriculture and forestry and also has to work for the market. So I think this is a place where we're going to see a lot of conversation, particularly in the run up to the 23 Farm Bill. I think, again, we would very much welcome your all's inputs and thoughts. Real quick, and then I'll be leave it, Daryl, because I know you got some hands up. This yep, to yep. Tom's credit and his committee's credit that's the second the second recommendation is very broad based and it puts it out front where you you opens the conversation for more specifics as we go ahead so i fully support it 100 percent. so thank you very much okay so we have two additional hands raised uh, one from paul lightfoot the other from michael janis and we'll go in that order before you start speaking paul i do want to note that the um announcement regarding that three three billion in investment and agriculture, animal health and nutrition and the unveiling of that um, new climate partnership initiative is in the chat. I put the link to that in the chat for those attendees um, as panelists or in the public that wanna um, read background information on um, the, the um, smart climate initiative. All right, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Great. So um, so thanks for joining us, I really appreciate it. And you know, the, the, the fruit and vegetable industry feels pretty good about its relative standing, you know, in carbon footprints relative to the rest of the food system. Um, and I think objectively so. Um, and I have a follow-up question to sort of the standards discussion you had a moment ago. And this is 
not coming right out of our recommendations, but is actually more related to my curiosity as to how the administration is thinking. If we go back historically, we can see that consumers have generally paid more and increased the market share of organic food somewhat, or at least materially in part, because they perceive it to be better for the environment. And logically, you know, if that carries into the future, which I think it would, I think consumers would also um, select more and drive more market share and perhaps pay higher pricing for foods that they perceive to have better carbon footprints. And you can keep going logically. Uh, maybe you'll even find foods that have carbon negative footprints, right? And, and they would have a competitive advantage in terms of market share and demand and, and, and pricing relative to foods that, that were big emitters of carbon. The problem today is that there's, it's a dog's breakfast of like standards. There's like 40 something different sort of sustainability labels out there, but we're seeing movement ahead of us in, in Europe, obviously, but we're also seeing some voluntary carbon labeling, although it's sometimes European companies with, with market share in the United States. Um, and I'll, I'll, I know that it's, it's early days in all this, but I'm curious as to how we could get to a point where even on a voluntary basis, there would be some sort of standardization for footprint labeling. Um, and I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that and, and whether you think the federal government has a role to play in it. Great question. And, you know, part of the way when we um, started to put the, this Climate Smart Partnership initiative together, um, we're thinking broad, more broadly than just uh, carbon credits. We're thinking the way you're thinking, which is um, there may be market opportunities for, for carbon offsets. We already see some of that voluntarily seed in California through the uh, 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 the mandatory market there, the, the compliance market there. But there are a lot more opportunities to think about exactly what you're talking about, ways producers could market climate smart commodities, sustainable commodities, whatever it is. And so in thinking about the Climate Smart uh, Partnership Initiative, we want to open the aperture a little bit to allow for th that type of creativity in addition to folks that may be interested in, in the greenhouse, just the greenhouse gas offset uh, or supply chain side, you know, they're interested, they're folks interested in greening their, uh, or reducing their carbon footprint associated with, with supply chains. And so we're trying to promote exactly that type of thinking and to help uh, de-risk it so producers can try some things and not worry about the costs of both deploying the practices and then measuring them and not having a you know a, a market at the end that may that may pay them back for that. So that's 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 part of the thinking there. And then again, as part of it, you're exactly right about standards. Again, I'm not sure we're in a place yet where USDA could come out and say, okay, guys, here's our standard, you know. Um, but I do think. Um, you know, part of the idea here is to fund a series of large scale pilots, pilots that are that are trying to do this at scale and that are trying to figure out, you know, how you do the measuring, monitoring, verification that is, again, cost effective for producers, but also that consumers will have confidence in and maintaining the, you know, you all know there's some skepticism in the environmental community and elsewhere around our ability to measure, monitor soil carbon forest carbon, other things. And so I think that that back end of measurement, monitoring, verification is really, really important. And then again, I think this whole question about standardization, how fast do we move? What role USDA, does USDA want to get into the standards business and standards uh, business in other parts of agriculture, you know, number two yellow corn or, or, or whatever it is. And so that's certainly a place that I think we, we would, um, welcome the conversation and our hope is is that as we think about designing um these these things moving forward that you know I, you, we could initially spit, um, put out some some guardrails for the types of of measurement and standardization methodology you want to see and over time you would hope that that you would get um a narrowing of that again to create more certainty both for producers but then for the market as well again um, just to reiterate, this is a place where I think the voice of agriculture is really, really important. Um, the voice of forestry as well. I mean, there are folks in the forest industry right now I've had conversations with, they're asking the same questions. They may want to produce a carbon credit, but they're also really interested in the carbon footprint. They have investors who are investing in, in forest land in the U.S., many of them from outside the U.S., 
that ability to be able to to have something that they can point to um, uh, that that has consumer confidence is really really important, and they're starting to look to USDA for that as well. So, really important conversation, and and uh, you know really welcome kind of your all's uh, creative thinking on this. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Okay, and so before we get to Michael Genesis' uh, question that's related to infrastructure, um, he has agreed to allow um, this. Uh, climate related question from Representative um, Don Zay. And the question for you, Robert, is, is it the intent of a federal carbon standard or baseline to recognize and credit state regulatory requirements that already support carbon sequestration? Yes. Let me know if you need, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so we, we've got, right now, we can support all kinds of things through our um, you know, through conservation, our conservation programs, we can cost share whether somebody's in California and developing, um, you know, looking to, to develop ways that um, uh, they might use um, climate smart agriculture or forestry in California to, to play into the compliance market. So th there are already ways that the USDA is, is uh, can help um, finance some of that. And I think we would certainly, um, as part of this Climate Smart Partnership Initiative, I mean, one of the reasons we went out with a, uh, with a public comment period was actually to take questions on things exactly like this. Do we want to entertain projects that might be playing into a, a, a compliance market such as California? I do think that there are already folks um, working on greening their supply chains or involved in, in the production of climate smart commodities. We certainly want to, um, uh, we want to look at um, uh, projects there. And so I think as we move towards thinking about what, what is it that we ask for as we go out and, and, and seek kind of proposals around these pilot projects, one of the things we'll have to deal with is how do we deal with the existing uh, compliance market in, in California to extend in, in New England with the um, with the uh, regional greenhouse gas um, uh, uh, initiative there. So I don't think we have a full answer yet, um, but I think one of the things we, as we look to projects, we wanna, I think we want a broad portfolio of where some people are thinking about carbon markets, other folks are thinking about climate smart commodities, other folks are thinking about maybe, maybe on the bioenergy side, a, a low carbon fuel, a low carbon biofuel. So I think, because we're thinking more broadly beyond just carbon markets, I think there's going to be some um, diversity there, and the hope is is that will um, uh, that will generate some some um, some creativity there that I think we can all learn from. If there's no follow up, Don, I, I'll switch to Michael. Go ahead. Good yep. morning, okay. Robert. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, yeah. Really appreciate you sharing that the uh, secretary sees um, has seen real value in connecting the dots to uh, infrastructure and USDA by using the word uh, nutrition. Just wondering um, if he would, do you think he would see uh, the word food infrastructure as complementary to nutrition infrastructure? Yeah, I, I'm sure. And there, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of interest in um, in obviously. Uh, food systems right now, and um, and the deputy is spending a lot of time on that. The secretary as well. Um, um, you know, you've you've probably seen some of the work we've we've done around that on the um, uh, sustainable productivity growth coalition and and some of that work. So a lot of interest in food systems and and food infrastructure right now. The secretary likes to talk about uh, nutrition as part of that. So I, I think um, that's all friendly. The other thing I would say is lots of interest right now, as you all know better than me, in, in, um, uh, in, in supply chains and some, of the, uh, and some of the challenges there. So there's a lot of thinking in ways. I mean, I was, I was here during the Obama administration. There's a lot of thinking about supply chains and food systems and in ways that there hasn't been before given just some of the challenges we're having in, uh, with supply chains right now. So I think that that's an opportunity for us to, to elevate these issues, to get greater public understanding and to get greater understanding, not just in the Department of Agriculture, but 
more broadly in the in the federal executive branches and, and on the Hill as well. Thank you so much. All righty. Great engagement. I'm looking to see if there are any additional questions from the committee. Any hands raised? Seeing none. I, I think that sort of wraps up this session, unless there are any closing comments from um, uh, Paul Lightfoot or um, uh, Secretary Julie M Master Belay. My only comment yeah. is one of is one of gratitude. Thanks for that super interesting discussion. Excellent. Thank, thanks for your all's time, and I just to reiterate. Um, for those of you that submitted comments to the RFI, much obliged. If you still have ideas, thoughts, want to engage, we're, we're all ears, not only on that, but just more broadly on, on climate, on food systems, food infrastructure. So really welcome the conversation today and going forward. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Greatly appreciate your time. Have a good day. All righty, so let's look and see what's next on the agenda. Um, I'm almost certain that it's going to be the food safety subcommittee. Let me make sure that I have our sort of um, USDA food safety experts on the line. Um, let's see if Audrey's present, and we do have Audrey present. Um, and then Ken Peterson. Ken and Audrey, can you come off mute so that we can make sure that your audio is all set? All right, Thanks. and we heard you, Ken. Audrey? Hi, Darrell. Excellent, thank you. All righty, so I am going to start the reshare for the next presentation. PowerPoint slide, share. Kylie Hopper Larson. Are you there? Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, and uh, I want to take the opportunity to go ahead and say thank you, Darrell Hughes, our designated federal officer, for always being a great administrator of our committees and our subcommittees' time. I also wanted to give appropriate credit to my subcommittee members, Casey Eli, David Sherrod, Paul Teague, Troy Bland, and Carla Stockley who have actively participated in some most lively discussions to create a list of three recommendations that we will be going over. I also wanted to give gratitude to our subject matter experts, Dr. Audrey Draper. She is USDA's liaison to the FDA and serves a very vital and critical role as we proceed. Um, in the development of the Food Safety Modernization Act and the activity therein. I also want to give uh, acknowledgement for his dramatic co contributions uh, formally in his role as Chief of the Audit Services Branch and now in his newly minted role of the Associate Deputy Administrator, Mr. Ken Peterson, and they will be coming on after we review our three recommendations. The first recommendation that our food safety subcommittee uh, submitted um, is uh, we recommend that the agriculture secretary ensure that the USDA participates fully in discussions that FDA is having with Mexico's Cinesica and Cofrefrost agencies if its intent is on establishing food safety system recognition and equivalency. This involvement should include active participation in the following work group activities, strategic priorities, laboratory collaboration, outbreak response, and food safety training. So, Darrell, I do see that that is listed as number nine. We actually did remove number eight uh, in our previous discussion. Um, to give some additional background uh, on this particular food safety uh, recommendation, we want to acknowledge that Mexican growers exporting to the U.S. 
must comply with the FDA's produce safety rule, as well as the foreign supplier verification and preventive controls rule. And currently, um, in Mexico, 11,596 persons have been trained as produce safety rule certified growers. Um, this is uh, much lower than the education rates that have been done here in the United States to improve food safety compliance, which we actually have 43,742. Um, the USDA, we want to acknowledge that it plays a vital and critical role in protecting the American producer and our domestically grown products from foreign threats, including pests, illegal pesticide residues, plant diseases, and human pathogens. And we want to bring out, I know yesterday it was stated that our import pressure has grown because we are a global commodity, but it is a particular note that given that one third of all food products imported into the United States, 60% of fresh produce is imported from Mexico singly, and of note as well, 42 foodborne outbreaks during 2009 and 2014 have been associated with products produced in Mexico. Mexico also has the largest amount of federally refused shipments. So we would like to recommend uh, as a whole committee uh, that we want to ensure that the USDA is participating fully and that the expertise that has been provided not only to our subcommittee, but also amongst the USDA, which has provided much expertise to the FDA in the development of the agricultural water standards uh, that are out for review, and we hope that will be finally published, um, is given the, uh, the due concern that is needed. We want to keep Americans supplied with year-round food options, and we want to keep that as a priority, protecting our domestic food supply from potential external threats without the inclusion of the USDA, we feel undermines food security and the defense of our great nation. So moving on uh, to uh, number nine, uh, we would like to uh, read the following recommendation. The subcommittee recommends the agriculture secretary provide additional funding for increased imported fresh fruit and vegetable pest and disease inspection, sampling and evaluation, as well as multi-residue pesticide screening at all points of entry. According to a July 2020 Congressional Service report titled the U.S. Food and Agricultural Imports Safeguards and Selected Issues, the value of imported fresh and processed fruits and vegetables has tripled to over $30 billion since 1998. This increased um, importation presents a uh, a very interesting need for an increased amount of personnel, technology, and also testing. We feel as a subcommittee that the USDA staff are doing a fine job. They, uh, they have numerical data that was published um, that, that states that they do not uh, follow as the FDA does a risk-based predictive algorithm with a score, they actually perform live random testing based on risk and commodity. And we feel that this is imperative to protect the American public. Therefore, needing more specific funding for the hiring of staff and technology improvement to conduct these staff tasks is instrumental in achieving this particular recommendations goal. Moving on to our last recommendation, which is number 10, the FBIC recommends that the Agriculture Secretary seek adequate recurring line item appropriation. Um, on FISMA, uh, educational efforts as well as the USDA's National Organic Program. We have been very impressed as a subcommittee 
on the level of training that the USDA has provided both online as well as in person for these purposes. And we would ask that the Agricultural Secretary provide that specific funding. In particular, the USDA NOP online training helps organic producers gain market access. FISMA training helps producers also gain market access. With education, there is opportunity. Growers, particularly small growers like myself, need all the support that they can get to access new markets. There also within this conversation are several audit organizations that can help verify organic practices. However, when we think about food safety, food safety as a whole, and that's what my subcommittee is focused on, um, we need food safety audits for market access. And I do want to point out that the USDA lunch program within this conversation of education um, brings an interesting point that only the USDA version of the harmonized audit is permitted, um, and this is potentially inhibiting small growers um, from having the increased flexibility that they may need from a GFSI benchmarked audit. So within that education, uh, we need the ability for that market access, and we want to see the USDA take uh, its knowledge and expertise and put it out uh, so that producers can access it. And we do want to say that we greatly appreciate what has already been done successfully, and we want to see more of it through funding. Thank you. I will be turning over uh, the floor uh, to our subject matter experts for more in-depth discussion. That is Dr. Audrey Draper and Mr. Ken Peterson. Good afternoon. Good morning. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, really, at this point, um, we're we're here to answer any any questions um, that the committee may have um, that we may be able to provide uh, regarding these these recommendations that uh, that you proposed and, and and be a resource. So, with that, I'll open the floor to any questions that you may have. Kylie, I knew that um, toward the top of, well, I, I think that, um, when we were trying to shore up our SMEs, there was um, some um, scheduling conflicts between trying to get you connected with Audrey and Ken and, um, and to discuss the recommendations, the draft recommendations. Um, did that happen already? And you guys are all, okay, got it. So I was, <laughs> I was like, why, why is there silence? <laughs> okay. That, that, that would be the reason. Um, uh, we, uh, and that's why I wanted to make sure that, that I shared because they si spent significant amount of time going over um, uh, the makeup of our subcommittee, uh, the recommendations that were put out, what the background uh, said, and they had many questions. Uh, that I answered. I also asked them for additional questions, and I do want to say um, that uh, Audrey uh, found the numeric values for training uh, uh, for me uh, in her role as the USDA liaison to the FDA, which I felt were most important to share uh, today to demonstrate how American producers are really attempting to comply uh, with the Food Safety Modernization Act uh, and uh, moving forward, I just think that both of these subject matter experts uh, need to continue to uh, be a part of this particular subcommittee. Excellent. Well, then I'll turn uh, to the remaining um, FAIC representatives. I don't see any hands raised. And uh, so I would do my typical countdown. <laughs> Actually, before I do a countdown, let me make sure that the the um, next speakers are on the line. I told them maybe sign on early by 11.30 and we're at 11.10.50. So let's see. And, and I know you're here for their market news discussion. Oh, wait, I see a hand. Let's go to David Zaff. 
Yes, thank you. Sorry, I had to unmute for a second. Uh, first of all, thank you to the, the subcommittee uh, for, for the work they've done in putting together these uh, recommendations. Uh, I did have a question in regard to the uh, number nine and to get the USDA's perspective, um, this is calling for additional funding. Um, and I wanna get the USDA's perspective. Do they feel like there is insufficient funding currently for these enforcement activities to ensure uh, compliance with US standards? Um, specifically to number nine, I mean, the, the um, import product testing disease, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's kind of a combination of APHIS and, and FDA um, jurisdictions. So at this point, I, I don't have any, any thoughts one way or the other, because I'm just not familiar enough with those, those programs to, to answer the question, quite honestly, so. Understood. If I may, David, I would like to offer some comments uh, that we included in the background uh, for number nine to give you some perspective. Um, the FDA, in, in its efforts, um, is currently only inspecting 1% of all import lines yearly, um, a rate that has not been improved since FISMA implementation. So um, the, the additional thing to consider is that uh, funding in March 2020 provided support for U.S. Customs and Border Patrol to hire 240 agricultural inspectors and technicians. However, this is still not enough currently to safeguard the consumer uh, and domestic production. USDA APHIS is actively involved and, and has the team and the reputation, the, the knowledge, the capacity, and the willingness to train more staff for this purpose. However, without that funding, they cannot hire more personnel, nor can they deploy and commission additional technologies that are needed to work smarter and not harder so that we can protect our domestic food supply. Thank you. All right, so um, I think if we are mostly done with our food safety discussion, we're gonna bleed um, into the market news data discussion. I've pinged our colleagues who were planning to sign on at 1130. They're actively um, leaving a meeting and we'll join the call right now. And so I will stop this presentation and I'll queue up the next presentation. If there's dead silence, that's okay. I'm just getting everything set up because we're running ahead and that's a good thing because it sounds like it'll give the committee more time in the afternoon to discuss um, the recommendations from each subcommittee that you all would decide to move forward. Um, and if it turns out, you know, there's a lot that you've done in the background, you may be able to um, end the day early. Damn, Daryl, we're good, aren't we? <laughs> yes, indeed. Hey, Darrell, Darrell. I, can see that, I can see that John Okanusti has signed in and is live now. Yeah. How are you today? Excellent. Yeah, Terry, uh, we were having our weekly staff meeting, so we just yeah, got everybody short there. He, he, they should be, Terry and Kim should be joining us here shortly. Okay. Thank you, John. I appreciate you guys um, casting your, <laughs> jumping out of your staff to join the call today. We were almost done. Okay. I can also now see that Kim Mercer with Special Crowd Market News has joined us as well. Hello, Kim. How are you today? Good morning, Jeff. Thanks. How are you doing? Jeff, while I queue up the presentation, let me know when Terry's on and then I'll spotlight Terry. I sure will, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and once we have Terry on, um, 
I'll just turn the flow over to you and then you can sort of introduce the discussion. And um, I don't know who's going to lead the presentation, but we'll have you, Terry, and Kim on and you all can sort of take the floor from there. Does that work? Sorry, at the beginning you said Ken, right? Yes, Ken. Okay, my, my father's yeah. name is Ken too, so we go through that a lot. <laughs> There's a hand raised, Troy Bland. Was there, did you have a question for food safety or is this a different question? Troy? Let's see what's we have Terry on yet. Let's see. Uh, Not yet. I don't see Terry yet. His outlook late showing he's in a meeting, but uh I guess he hasn't hasn't joined us yet. I just sent him a note to let him know we're, that we're all on. Don, I see your hand is raised as well. Do you have a question? I do. Um, fill in some uh, dead space here. Um, since the food safety folks are on the line, um, question beyond the recommendations, um, as much a trade question as it is a food safety question. For those of us that ship product to China, there has been, of course, uh, uh, a wrangling of trying to get clarity on these decrees 248 and 249, starting back from April of this year to current. Um, there's a deadline of January 1 to file, uh, to register with the Chinese authorities and to have identified a, what they call a competent authority that oversees food safety issues so that all of our facilities can go through their registration process. There's really lack of clarity on what that is. We also have to have new uh, packaging uh, identification and, and standards um, with a, a, a mark on the packaging, both outside and in, as we understand that, that uh, signifies that we have been uh, certified by that competent authority and the registration number. Other countries, have made progress on this and at the very least identified their competent authority. We assume it's going to be FDA, but we can't get anybody to tell us. And so, you know, whether you're shipping soybeans or prunes to China, um, you're in the same position. We're trying to figure out how we move forward before the deadline of January 1, which could create a, a significant amount of, of, of headache for those of us that trade with China. Is there any new information on that? So uh, the only thing that I'm aware on, on this is literally like a day ago that we got the question that, that came in um, and we reached out to our, our colleagues in the, the Foreign Agriculture Service um, and they are, are looking uh, into this issue, but it, it really is from a USDA perspective is a, is a foreign ag service issue and, and trying to work through that. Um, you know, we can certainly when we hear from Foreign Ag Service uh, what's going on, we can certainly pass that information along to, to the committee um, once we've gotten it. Okay. Yeah, as you, as you can imagine, particularly with supply chain issues, uh, having to get packaging materials, design new packaging, um, you know, on top of having to register and follow all the other regulations that, again, do not have a lot of clarity other than translated memos from the Chinese authorities. Um, this could take a lot longer than January 1. So getting a delay to be able to promulgate all these things is gonna be really helpful. Otherwise, uh, major selling seasons around Chinese New Year, et cetera, get missed by a lot of agricultural specialty crops and commodities. All righty, and so on that note, I see that we have Terry Long with us and he's spotlighted along with Kim Mercer, John Okanowski. And so um, 
I'll turn the floor over to you, Ken Peterson, to kick off the market news data discussion. And then whoever ends up um, presenting the PowerPoint, just let me know when you want me to move to the next slide by saying next slide and I'll, pro I'll progress. Ken, you've got the floor. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I will uh, start by uh, introducing a couple of our colleagues here from our Fleshy Crops Market News Program. Um, we have Terry Long, who's the director of, of our Market News Program. Um, John Okanowski, who's the, the deputy director of Market News, and, and Kim Mercer, who's the assistant to the director uh, from our Market News Program. Um, so we're going to start off by uh, going through a quick presentation of um, what Market News does and, and their current services before we um, kind of move on to the, to the next part of the discussion. So uh, Terry and Tima, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks Ken. And we certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, we have this very uh, general and brief presentation that we'd like to share with you. Uh, again, we are Specialty Crop Market News, and I'm Terry Long, the director. So next, please. Next slide. Market News is, of course, the eyes and ears of American agriculture, as, as we have been since 1915. Next, please. Our mission is the same as it's been when, since we were formed, provide timely accurate, unbiased information on current, current agricultural markets. And again, this leads us to our motto, which is get it. In other words, the hardest part of our job is this data collection component. Get it right. We must have verification processes, quality control, buyers and sellers, and get it out. Again, we have to get it to the people when they need it in a format that they can use. Next, please. Uh, market levels covered by specialty crop market news, shipping point or FOB, terminal or wholesale markets, 12 in the U.S., uh, a number international. Retail, which is advertised weekly specials. This is a significant report closely followed. And again, only the advertised specials because they're such a key driver in the marketplace. And to a lesser extent, farmers markets and producer auctions. Uh, next, please. So one of our most important uh, components of information is the movement data. Uh, these are comprised of domestic shipments, truck and rail, crossing from Mexico and Canada, truck, air and boat, and then imports from the other countries of which we currently have a count of around 63 countries supplying fresh fruits and vegetables to the U.S., air, truck and boat. Next, please. Uh, this is an example. I mentioned the retail report. Uh, this covers over 300 uh, major chains in America uh, and represents uh, over 29,000 individual supermarket outlets in America. Uh, very closely watched, we break it down by product and by regions of the country. Next, please. The truck rate report. Um, this has long been one of our most closely watched reports, and anyone in the produce business, or actually in, in any business just about, knows that we are in a difficult situation relative to transportation. So we're trucking, trucking, we are tracking truck rates and availability from every major shipping point in the country uh, to the destination markets, and this is a graphic representation. You can see at a glance that almost everywhere in our nation, uh, trucks are, are short and the rates are going up. Next, please. Uh, th this is uh, the shipping point trends. We do this for each of the major commodity groups and each of the regions that we cover for that commodity group. So at a glance, you get a narrative and um, uh, a perspective on what happened in the past, what's happening now, and what's expected to happen in the future. So four commodities by region in the country, very detailed, very closely watched. Next, please. Um, this is the newest report that we have. Um, this was created at the request of the uh, United States International Trade Commission and the Office of the Secretary. 
uh, with the implementation of the NAFTA replacement agreement, which was the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, uh, they wanted us to focus on the uh, sensitive, uh, perishable agricultural commodities. So we have highlighted five of the most uh, sensitive agricultural commodities in this weekly narrative, in which we look at all aspects of the market, retail, shipping point, wholesale, the impact of ocean uh, freight costs, as well as availability of boats and containers. So as we know, this is a worldwide problem. In capturing this narrative, we're telling a story about these products for this North American market. So a narrative uh, approach with a broad range of data that has proven to be very popular. Next, please. So what's next? Uh, on November 1st, we opened the most recent uh, version of our customer satisfaction survey. This is a uh, common instrument, survey instrument used both in the government and in the private sector. It includes a standard set of questions that allows you to create an index, which allows you to compete, or I'm sorry, allows you to compare yourself with other federal agencies or with the private sector. So uh, this opened November 1st, so we will both have pop-up options as well as pushing it to our direct subscribers. Well, it's important to understand that we use this information not only to decide what we need to work on to improve, but also this is a direct performance measure for market news at the department level. So your feedback and your scores, if you will, are not only helping us improve service deliveries, but it also is a measure of how well we're doing for the department. So it's really important. Uh, if you would uh, take the time, if you get this link, please complete the survey. Next, please. The other key, uh, what's next, what's new, is our public facing uh, enhancement to our information site, previously the market news portal. Now the new site that's being rolled out slowly across all of market news, my market news. Now my market news is going to have significantly enhanced search tools, including an API. Uh, again, considering how much data USDA market news has, uh, these are really large blocks of data. You need an API to pull it out efficiently. Um, also, my market news will give you the ability to do uh, more with this data with less manual input, uh, again, improved tools. And lastly, something I already alluded to is we have these huge data sets and with my market news, you can now have direct access to these, you know, really large data sets. Uh, next, please. Um, this is a quick overview of what specialty crop market news does for you, for us, for the sector. And uh, uh, again, my assistant, John Okanowski, and uh, assistant to the director, Kim Mercer, are with us today. Uh, and we'd be delighted to uh, answer any questions. And thank you for your time and your attention. All right, before you guys get started with um, engaging with the committee, just want to make a quick announcement that I'm going to take the survey link and post it in the chat for anyone who's interested in uh, taking the survey. Uh, I can turn the floor back over to you, Terry, to engage with the members. Uh, I think Ken's leading this portion, Ken. Thank you, and thanks, Terry, for, for that presentation. So really, the, the purpose of the, the next little bit of time that we've got here is we really want to engage with the committee and get your thoughts and input on um, you know, what additional services uh, could market news uh, provide to the industry? What are some reports that, that maybe that um, you've seen um, elsewhere that you know, maybe market news can, can take on? What other types of information, um, you know, marketing information, um, would be valuable to you as, as an industry that, that market news is either isn't currently um, collecting or reporting on, or you know, maybe is, is doing it in a, in a small 
small segment of the industry and you'd like to see you know that be expanded um, so really this is this is kind of a, a brainstorming session um, if you were to, to solicit um, thoughts and input from from you all on the on the advisory committee and um, answer any questions that you may have about about market new services we've got uh, the brain trust here um, to, to answer those questions and, and provide thoughts and, and feedback on on any of your thoughts or suggestions. So and you have two. Yep, you've got two questions. First up, David Zaft, and then after David, we'll uh, go to Kylie. David, you have the floor. Great, thank you. Um, Ken, I guess my first question is, as the uh, frozen guy out here, is, uh, is there any intent or any possibility that these services would be ex um, expanded to non-fresh uh, produce uh, avenues and data sets? Um. Certainly so. Uh, David, one of the things that we say is if, the, uh, if there is a desire in the part of the industry uh, and there is cooperation, in other words, if the industry wants this and will provide the data, uh, you know, market news is, of course, protected by law to keep it confidential. We can provide market coverage for any product group, again, if there is cooperation and support within the stakeholders in that sector. Um, Having said that, we do cover some products, uh, apple juice concentrate, uh, frozen apple juice concentrates, uh, certain other, but it's a, it's a pretty small list of processed products or partially processed products that we cover. Could we expand to that? We certainly could if that uh, were identified by the sector and uh, we had a large enough pool of cooperation. Understood. Thank you. So, Kylie. All right. Kylie. Thank you very much, uh, Terry and Brain Trust. Um, uh, as a regular user of your data, um, uh, I, along with my husband, are uh, almost daily checking out pricing trucks uh, because that impacts uh, our uh, ability as well as our customers' ability to regularly comply with other things. Uh, going on. Um, so we know where priorities lie then. Markets are high, prices are high. We may need to position other things. With that being considered, um, the amount of data is immense. So it's harder to aggregate that data on a smartphone where uh -huh. all of us operate. Is there any um, intent to have um, a USDA AMS market news focused app where the user could select filters uh, to aggregate specific amounts of data so that when they logged in to their app, it would already pull that information for them. Okay. Um Kylie, it's good to see you again, and thank you for the question. Um, you will be interested to note that AMS has an effort afoot as we speak. Our uh, colleagues in livestock, poultry, and grain market news uh, are the uh, the front men, if so, or the front front folks, so to speak, uh, on this effort. But the plan is to develop it there and deploy it across all of market news. This is not in weeks you know it's, it's certainly months but yeah it is a um, it is a project for market news as an agency and I really appreciate your description uh, uh, Kylie of, of the things that would help you as a user with your phone ie against uh, these having these be able to select filters to aggregate specifically the data that you want in the region you are so I think that makes perfect sense that's really good feedback for us but I will tell you, it is an effort that we have afoot, as they say. So thank you. Thank you. And if I might also include uh, in uh, the filters uh, that uh, in, in pricing in particular, and I know many other people on this committee uh, look at it or they have their analysts within their companies look at it, if price floor 
by the uh, user could be established. They select that information, and if there's a trigger, right, at a point where a price goes above, if uh, alert could happen as well by the different markets, I think that that would be a particular note and could help huh. position our domestic uh, folks uh, to uh, be able to use data because data is one of the strongest things that the USDA has to help its producers. No question. No question. A, a great point there. You know, uh, Kylie, we work very closely with our uh, market news like partners in the hemisphere. Uh, and one of the things that we do is have a monthly or frequent technical presentations. One of the tools we see developing around, being developed around us, uh, are the, uh, the ability to do some of the filters you described, but also to have specific triggers. Now, they're more concerned about, you know, the consumer price being so high that they'll have, you know, civil unrest. Well, now, our purpose in having the trigger is different, but the things we're learning from these other people, I wondered how valuable these triggers would be to our customers compared to, say, in uh, Guatemala. But, you know, hearing from people like yourself who are, you know, important players in the industry uh, helps me rethink that. But there are some models for us to look at, uh, uh, Kylie, to look at that, to see if that's something we could add as we further develop my market news and this phone app we talked about. Thank you. Thank you very much to your entire team for the valuable work that they continue to provide and, and being a leader on the data aggregation as well as communication to us. Thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to add a tiny bit to Terry's answer. Um, he mentioned My Market News and My Market News was developed to be viewed by mobile devices. So it should be much better um, to use in the meantime than our current website. And then, of course, while you're waiting on that um, mobile app. Great point. Thank you, Kim. And Kyle, let me follow up on what Kim just said, is that our original design was to avoid basically having a phone app. But here we are several years in going, OK, that might not have been the right decision. It seemed right at the time. So as we speak, as I told you, we're you know, attempting to address that issue. So thanks, Kim, for that addition. Do we have any other hands up? I can't really see hands. So yeah, I'm going through. There was one hand raised, but I think maybe the representative's question was answered or um, I, I don't see that hand anymore. So if there, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a call out just in case um, someone's thinking and they now have a question. Are there any other questions from the uh, FACA representatives? Going once, going twice. So, all righty. <laughs> so we are running um, ahead by a lot. And so I think uh, that's Darrell, a good thing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention a couple of things, if I could, to the group before we go, if we have a minute. Yes. Yes, you do. You have many minutes. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to tell this group that prior to our meeting today that uh, Sonia uh, Jimenez and, and Heather and uh, uh Ken had met with I and uh, the market news team and said, you know, in preparation for this meeting, uh, what else might market news do, especially crop market news to serve the sector? And we have worked on some ideas and uh, uh, again, there are a number of things we'd like to think about. Uh, Kylie highlighted the, the phone app that we're working on and, and specific uh, attributes to uh, add or improve. Um, one of the models that we've seen from our partners in South America is they are building or have built a price predictive model or tool for their wholesale market uh, report. In Uruguay, they only have one major market and uh, it's very well covered very good movement data, uh, the volume of entries example. Um, they have built or attempted to build a price predictive model. And uh, we are interested in looking at that and learning from that to see if there's an application for us. I might add, I showed the uh, new 
uh, U.S. Mexico Canada Agreement uh, report. Uh, the feedback we're seeing and hearing from our customers is, you know, this is really helpful. You're putting the data in a simple format just for my industry or just for my commodity group. Uh, it's an expanded version of that weekly trends focused on these sensitive commodities. Uh, uh, our customers have found that very useful. So as Kylie said, instead of our analysts digging through all that data, you've pulled it all up in a simple uh, format with graphics, uh, very useful. So that's one area that we'd like to see if we can expand into. And then lastly, I mentioned this uh, alliance or this network of cooperation uh, with the market news teams around the hemisphere. It's called the Market Information Organization of the Americas, and uh, AMS serves as the chair. Our goal is through this alliance to access more markets for our customers uh, with you know, detailed, reliable data, whether it's Mexico City or Bogota, Colombia or Toronto, Canada. So uh, that's uh, one other area I wanted to mention, Darrell, and thank you for the time that we're looking at. Uh, again, the price predictive model developed by the partners in South America, uh, uh, international markets of interest, and then also these more detailed or defined narrative type reports that serve a sector or a, um, or a commodity group like berries. So anyway, I, I wanted to highlight those are areas we're looking at to grow the services that we offer the sector. So thank you for the time. Excellent. Uh, Kent, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and you know, uh, you know, we kind of put you, the committee up on the spot, as it were, you know, and sometimes after you've heard some discussions and, and had time to, to think through these, you know, you're, you know, sitting at the end of the day, reading a good book and something pops into your mind, please, if, if you've got any ideas that come to you about, you know, additional, additional things that market news can do for the industry, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, to uh, Darrell, to, to Terry or, or his team, um, so that we can, uh, take that information and, and kind of build it into uh, to this uh, initiative that we're working on on and looking at other services that that market news can provide to the industry. So, with that, I'd like to certainly thank Terry and John and and Kim for being on on the call today, and I'll turn it back to you. Bro. Thank you. Uh, so this is our last presentation of um, the uh, session. Really, um, we. Um, we'll turn to sort of evaluating each of the recommendations that the um, subcommittees put forth, select the top um, recommendation, and then um, move um, into planning for the next um, FACA meeting. But as of now, I think we could just go ahead and break for lunch early and have an extended lunch. Everyone plan a return by 1 p.m. Any objections to that, Paul Lightfoot? That was a thumbs up, I agree. All right, excellent. Um, I'll see you all back, at, back here at one o'clock. Thanks, Darrell. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Darrell. You're good to go, Darrell. Excellent, thanks, Jeff. And get the side by side gallery view set. All righty. Do a quick look to make sure that we've got most of the members here online. Excellent. All righty. So, my name is Darrell Hughes. I'm the designated federal officer of the Fruit and Vegetable Industry Advisory Committee. Um, day two and the last remaining day of the meeting. Um, it's what's happening now. And we are at the tail end of the meeting, actually, even though it's 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And so most of the work that we're going to get, get started is really going through the recommendations and determining which um, recommendation from each of the subcommittees we want to move for it and, and sort of refine or take notes on what needs to be um, re revised or refined with any other language. Um, 
Paul, is there anything that um, you want to say to the committee before we get started with that? Well, I think it'd be useful to have a framework for how we do this. And so uh, I guess I could start with a question, which is, do you recommend that um, you know, the, the, the chair of the subcommittee make a proposal, <clears throat> get the consensus of the subcommittee, and then bring it to the rest of the committee? Or is there a better way that you've got in mind? Yeah. So um, at, at this meeting, what happens is um, basically the draft recommendations that, that, are put, that have been put forth, they're all before the full committee. And so my plan was to do a sort of um, majority vote, up-down vote. We go to, let's just say, uh, client infrastructure and say, of these two recommendations, um, which recommendation do you all, um, would you all like to move for one or two? And we, we go around and, you know, get which number from each of the, the members. And then when they say, if, if it turns out to be two, then we look at two and say, what language about that recommendation do we need to refine? Does that answer? And how, it does. And how much time do you think we have? Um, we have until three o'clock. We, we've um, got, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess if I could add maybe one twist to that, Terrell, I loved your idea. I think it's a great one. I'd love to at least hear the subcommittee's um, opinions before we ask for an up-down vote from the whole committee. Is that okay? Yeah, that's totally fine. All right, great. Let's do it. All righty. So let me reduce this screen. Uh, since client and infrastructure, I reorganized um, the um, presentations to for a different reason. So we have client and infrastructure up first. Tom, are you on the line? I see you. I, I am on the line, Darrell. Okay, I'll spotlight you for everyone. All right. You all have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Darrell. Uh, you know, I think, you know, both of our recommendations had some, have some legs in terms of the current discussion as we look around, you know, just that whole process around infrastructure and uh, yeah, and new new funds available for new technologies, which I think are really important to, to deal with some of the climate issues that we're we're trying to deal with. Um, you know, Paul, this is one of those things where you're asking us to pick which children do you love the most. <laughs> but uh, so I might have a little bit of a hard time kind of picking, but I'd be curious to hear from some of the other subcommittee members of any of their thoughts here as well. If we had to, to pick one. Uh, which would it be? And I was hoping we'd get further than three minutes in before someone would say, "I want, I want both." <laughs> let's let's do our best. And maybe Tom, you're right. Maybe your 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 other subcommittee members could just you know chat, just chime in and and, and say what they would choose if they had to choose. Paul, I, this is George Hamler. I, the dilemma is is that you've got two very different issues on the table. It's not like you you've overlapped and you could fine tune into one. So. You're asking about whether we whether we uh, uh, enhance the use of infrastructure or we go into greening products to enhance the climate. I mean, and I don't, man, I, you are asking somebody to split babies here. Holly, I see your hand raised. Go ahead and jump right in. Hi, everybody. Uh, even though I'm not a member of this particular subcommittee, I uh, was retained from the previous committee, um, as well as uh, Casey Eli uh, was, and, and Brett um, Erickson. And uh, previously, uh, we were um, uh, before the whole committee. Uh, there would be much discussion uh, for refinement, which ones to throw out, which ones to keep. Um, but the subcommittees presented this as what we would like to keep. Um, so it was just brought to, to the floor and there was much debate, Paul, unfortunately, uh, for you. Um, and then votes were occurred, which ones to extract and which ones to remove. So just from previous history. I do understand that the subcommittees identifying one to pull um, could 
help streamline things a bit, but I think that that's going to be pretty hard with some of the subcommittees. Well, and Tom I, I was have, also a my neck out. member as well. Tom, I'll stick my neck out. I think there's an infrastructure bill in front of the Congress now. Yep. If any luck, that'll take care of some of the rural internet issues that brought this up to begin with. And so I guess in my case, I'm going with number two. Let's work on the climate. Yeah, I, I'll I chime can, in. I'll, I'll, oh. I can kind of get behind that as well. That you know, we I think it's a great discussion, and I know that Secretary Vilsack does have that food systems frame of mind and uh, is taking that into account. So I think, yeah, if we did have to to run with one, I think you know George's comment there about focusing on the the technology and the recommendations of more grants uh, might be uh, a little bit higher on the priority list or ability to have some impact with. And certainly that's what we, we heard from Robert Bonney. He, he, uh, he had a lot of energy about number two and thought that it dovetailed nicely with, with some priorities they're already, they already working on and for which they're asking for comments. I, I'd agree. And I see Don, Don Zay's hand raised. Go ahead, jump right in, Don. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Uh, point of clarification, I, the last time we, we did this, I recall more than one recommendation going forward. Am I wrong? Yeah, so the last time we did this, we had lots of recommendation moved forward. It was like almost 30, over 30. And a lot of the recommendations that moved forward, they had to do with issues that were A, um, outside of USDA's purview, like we've just discussed extensively in the committee, and then uh, um, recommendations that move forward on things that USDA had already put in place. And so the goal with this committee is to streamline and move forward the most meaningful recommendations um, from each of the, the, the work groups um, so that there is um, significant or um, worthwhile impact. A lot of the recommendations um, from the prior committee, it's, it was sort of like, this has been done already, or right. this can be achieved by meeting with this person. So the goal is to um, enhance uh, your work and your guidance to USDA. Okay, well, our, uh, our task isn't as difficult as food safety will be for sure. But uh, uh, w what I would say is, um, I, I, I agree with the comments so far, although I will say this. Um, the the amount of money flying around right now um, is you know insurmountable, and and uh, the 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 question of funds for technology on this issue of climate with all of the the critical mass behind climate, um, while it's always good to fight for more, it seems as though it will. Um, likely be a part of whatever package goes forward. There's so much uncertainty about what we'll be studying and what technology will be required. I think we have a long way to go. I can argue that the messaging um, about infrastructure and why food should be right up there at the top, whether it's from a national security perspective or whatever perspective is, is paramount in my mind. And the more people say that, the more agriculture wins. And um, so, as a, uh, it's 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 a bit of a, a an obtuse recommendation. I I fully admit that, but I do think that it's a, it's an important one. So I would just I would just register those comments. Is there further discussion? It's Michael Jen. Oh, oh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, the only thing I would add, um, just perspective, and I apologize, I should have brought this up with Robert Bonney. We were fortunate to have the uh, chair of the Appropriations um, Committee, um, Congressman um, McGovern, to the market, uh, the SF market recently. Um, and um, it was interesting. On um, We briefly mentioned the word infrastructure with him. Uh, and it was really interesting. Before he left, I can't tell you how many times he reiterated in, from his opinion, his perspective, how critical things uh, of docks and refrigeration and all the things that are so critical to the food system and to the food chain, in his opinion, how much that is a key part of our national infrastructure. 
so I just share that as a perspective of a, a you know a, of a leader in the uh, in Congress and his perspective when he sees when he saw docks and trucks and refrigeration and you know that goes along with every aspect of the distribution chain. Is the uh, can you dovetail uh, the technology you were talking about, uh, Don, into the into the first one and think is is technology and climate watching what we do as life goes on is that an infrastructure yeah i i think that's an excellent idea actually um yeah i just i i mean if if you were to do an audit of messaging out there in the public policy arena about infrastructure particularly the the bill that, that's proposed um i don't think food comes up very often people think about broadband people think about supply chain issues they don't think about food necessarily in supply chain and and uh, uh, transportation corridors, et cetera. And so I just think the more we can underscore that, the, the, the higher we are in the food chain, so to speak, of, of uh, public policymakers. So if you combined it with technology, I, I, I think it's, it's uh, a powerful statement more so than if it was just a platitude. Okay, Tom, you got the marching orders. How long you got to put it together before we vote? Yeah, I, I think I can hear the discussion here of how do we merge these a bit and uh, carry both messages in one recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, either of these is going to face based on our discussions yesterday and, um, or on the, this morning, um, some significant uh, rewrites. So I think that, you know, regardless of which one moves forward, we're going to have, we're going to want to um, take it offline and edit. It. And if we can rewrite it so that um, the, um, you know, the green uh, technology side and funding is, is part of the infrastructure, then I think that it might have, you know, it's, it'll add some of the specificity that, uh, that the first one uh, needs in addition to how it's, how it's currently written. Agreed. Good at kicking the can down the road or what? No, it's not. It's not kicking the can down the road because even if you were to decide to uh, go with one or the other, we would still in the background go back and I would work with each of the leads and make sure that the language is refined and there are no um, errors or whatnot. And so this just gives, uh, that'll, just, that'll just be one additional step where Tom will work to refine and consolidate the recommendations. And then um, we, we, we can set a, a deadline on when, that, when we need that, that recommendation back and then um, package everything up and move it forward so that everything moves forward within this year. Uh, Sonia, I see your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanna make sure that um, everybody understands that we AMS will put forward whatever the recommendation of the committee is whether it's one, two, three, four, five, 20, uh, like we have done in the past. So this is up to the committee to, to decide how many recommendations. It is our, um, due to our experience in the past, <clears throat> if you sent 50 recommendations, <clears throat> excuse me, things kind of get lost. So that's, that's, I guess that's what we're trying to convey that you want to be very careful about how many you send forward because of that. But AMS doesn't have a, a preference one way or another. I think the com if this is your committee and your recommendations. Um, we're just trying to say that, you know, if you send 50, some of them are going to get lost. <laughs> so uh, that, that's all we're trying to say. Michael, what do you think? Do you think we can blend them? I mean, technology is under in a way and in to be considered construction. Yeah, I, I if that's just to me, George. Uh, yeah, I do think we uh, working, you know, the team working together, we're able to to, to make uh, to, to incorporate with some time.
And uh, did we lose Darrell? Did we lose your connection? No, I, no, I'm still here. Okay. I was just letting you all um, engage. Um, so are we ready to just move to the next um, set of recommendations? Tom? I, I, I feel like we have some direction here in terms of both uh, being important components and how can we weave certain pieces of the green technology into the discussion around food infrastructure. So. Great. All right, consumption's up next. Um, Brett? Yeah, Darrell, um, just a, a comment, you know, based on the, the, the discussion from the first group and a little bit of, you know, what Kylie had said when, when we went through this the last time, obviously it's tough to do, to, to do these subgroup discussions um, when we're not in the same room and we can break out and, and meet amongst ourselves. But between, you know, what I'd like to do um, with my group, if it's okay, it's going to be similar to number one. You know, there, there's basically two components to our recommendations, and one is increasing consumption of uh, fruits and vegetables. The other is promoting domestic uh, production. And um, since yesterday, I've received some emails and and feedback on um, ways that we might consolidate in, into a broader um, recommendation. Um, and get it streamlined and, and broadened. So what I would like to ask, you know, for, from the consumption group is um, I'd like for us to, I'd like to do some reworking on this and work with the, uh, with some of the trade folks to um, streamline and, and uh, broaden and improve uh, our recommendation and run that through our, our subcommittee and then uh, bring it back to the group at a future time. Clarifying question maybe, do you, Brad, do you have a sense of what you think the timing would be? Um, I think that we could have it done within a matter of uh, maybe a month or less. It. I don't think it's gonna, um, as I've, I've got a quite a bit of, of feedback already that I want to start incorporating. Um, it'd just be a matter of when I can get our group together um, to review and approve and then bring it back in front of this group. And Darrell, that would push against, but maybe not destroy our, the timeline that we had talked about at the, at the outset of this event. What do you think? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, this that so that that could very well have happened based on um, the information that you all received from the various subject matter experts. And so, um, what Brett's asking for, yeah, it'll adjust the timeline, but it, that's not unreasonable. Um, I mean, once you have new information, it's 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 good for you guys to go back and reevaluate. And so, yeah, sounds great, Brett. Then okay. I, I I think we're all in support. I appreciate it. So then the question is, um, we know that um, climate and infrastructure is doing the same thing. Um, do we want to just make it so that each of the, uh, make a blanket statement that each of the subcommittees will go back and do the exact same thing? And instead of making a decision about what moves forward on the other subcommittee, we sort of just go through each one and, just, and you guys provide comments and insights? Well, maybe, maybe, um... Let's have that as an as an opportunity and a, and a path that we should all feel comfortable with. But who knows? Maybe on the third one, they're going to say lightning has struck us, and we know exactly what we want, and okay. put it in the books. All right, <laughs> we'll give them that chance too. All right, let's hop to labor then. <laughs> You're going to test it. <laughs> let's see, Julie, where are you? Let's see if I can find you. I'm oh, here. I know. I just can't see you on my screen. That's all. There you go. You're spotlighted. All right. Okay. Um, uh, so um, we have uh, two very different uh, recommendations here. Um, the one is very broad, um, very goal oriented. Uh, the other one is very uh, narrow and very tactically oriented. 
um, you know, what I, what I will say uh, about um, our first uh, recommendation in that you know, the uh, agricultural secretary uh, collaborate uh, to prioritize um, these initiatives. Um, when we discussed, uh, when our committee uh, uh, was, uh, you know, was able to get together and have the, um, you, the, the stakeholders from the USDA speak with us about, you know, a lot of varying different issues. Uh, some of the challenges that we kept running into from uh, the uh, labor and production side of things, um, the cost drivers within our industry, um, is that a lot of these cost drivers are outside of the purview of the USDA. Um, particularly, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the, the labor component, um, that access to labor is managed through the Department of Labor. Um, you know, I, I would also like to bring up um, the uh, comments from United Fresh. They, they also addressed um, the labor issue um, in their comments as well. Um, you know, recognizing that the USA is not the primary agency in this space, um, but um, asking that they do play a, a pivotal role in ensuring that the industry does have essential workers, um, uh, you know, and that that is needed. Um, you know, one of the things that if we are, sorry, sorry about the not striking lightning here, but um, if we were to retool this one, um, we could take some of those thoughts into consideration that they provided in terms of how the USDA could look at the impact um, of the lack of labor um, and, and how those other agencies could, um, you know, uh, uh, help facilitate um, the labor um, to, uh, for uh, agriculture as well as when we look at some of the other uh, other aspects of this in terms of the Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, um, when we talk about land usage, when we talk about trucking um, and moving goods across across this country. Um, uh, that would be a thought in terms of how we could retool this. Um, in terms of combining them between the two, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing how that could be possible, but uh, when we then uh, step two and look at the you know whole farm revenue uh, protection um, thoughts. Um, of course, we did have the um, we did have the comments from um, uh, the, the RMA about you know what we could consider as a different uh, the next revenue limit. Like I said yesterday, I think that is a hard ask um, because that does take time to research what what would be an appropriate limit to put in place on that um, you know I understand from a budgetary standpoint it's probably something uh, that does need to be um, need to be discussed but I think uh, that's also um, you know something that would need to uh, have a lot of input from uh, statistical you know uh, possibly NAS data um, and things like that in terms of what what would be the appropriate uh, limit. Um, and of course, um, going to um, some of Georgia's comments yesterday, if we start to expand that and try and uh, integrate some of the handling um, and consumer product that end product sales as opposed to just the wholesale good, um, that automatically drives up that cost as well. Um, anyway, those, um, those are just kind of my initial thoughts on how we could retool the two different recommendations um, here um, and I'll I'll be quiet and let others chime in. I guess I what don't I don't see any. Go ahead. I guess when I talk to, to growers and, and we've had a couple regions that have repeatedly been hit in recent years with uh, you know weather events. You know it it's not insurance that they're talking to me about every every time it's it's labor in the current environment you know access to labor so if it can if it's at all in the purview of the department of agriculture and this committee i think that if i have to prioritize one for growers it is anything that helps them with access to labor so that they can get their product out of the field and into the market so I guess that's that's the one I would lean towards from my position.
so so then I I would I would say you know again one of the challenges then um, I think David just um, turned on his too he can he can chime in here as well and um, he he helped helped me a lot in terms of this um, but one of the challenges we have is is the you know well it's you know it's 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 outside um, so so yeah how can we retool this then to or how can we make sure that this is something that is in their scope is something we can have the USDA focus on. Um, like I said, that the the impact study that uh, United Fresh brought up might be a thought on that. But Dave, Dave, if you want to chime in, yeah, yeah, uh, Julie, just to, just to supplement that, and and, and David, uh, exactly what you focused on is what we spent several hours on discussing it. You know, with the subject matter experts, and every time that we tried to propose solutions of what we could do at the committee level. It was, well, it's outside of our jurisdiction. It's outside of our jurisdiction. And Darrell was on the, on the line for much of that. And um, that's the frustration that we have with labor. I mean, that's the elephant in the room. We all know that. Um, even with the struggles with the, you know, the Workforce Modernization Act that is having difficulty right now in the reconciliation process and all that. Um, so, so it really, it really tied our hands and, and we did have some frustration there. And we talked about everything from not only um, labor uh, to pallet shortages and trucking and all kinds of other things that impacted even labor in that respect directly or indirectly. And, and time and time again, we, we faced that, that, um, that obstacle that it's, that's more legislative uh, than something that's within the USDA's purview to to put dollars towards. So um, we struggled with that. And, and I think the industry struggles with that, right? So we hear you, um, but I think that we have these handcuffs that are very difficult for us at the recommendation stage. And you know, we just went round and round and, and had to focus on other things uh, that we could have an impact on, um, like the whole farm revenue uh, protection and things of that nature. So that's sort of where it left us from a practical standpoint. You know, Julie, you can comment if you think that, you know, there's more color there, but I think that's about what we had to deal with. Yeah, I, I think that summarized it really well. Um, uh, exactly. Um, uh, you know, the one thing um, uh, I think when we, the committee chairs had met briefly on one call, um, Darrell, if, if we had talked about, um, you know, as opposed to putting necessarily a, a recommendation in place on this, it's just a, you know, for lack of a better term, a mission statement or, or a, a position a, statement. Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again. A position statement. Yeah, yeah a position that's... statement. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, just in, in the sense of, um, you know, that this is such a challenging issue and, and yet the one agency that's supposed to be you know, backing up this, you know, helping this industry in this country isn't able to, um, isn't able to, to uh, assist in this arena um, because of, of the way um, their hands are tied, certainly, um, from a legislative perspective and a, where the, um, you know, the other agencies that are the primary agencies in the space. Um, I, I don't know if where where that came down to, if that was a possibility or not, or or if the committee as a whole would be um, in favor of that. Yeah, that's where the collaboration between the departments really came in as as close as we could get um, to fostering the communication. And I think somebody said a few moments ago that you know if you don't keep emphasizing in the conversation food and ag, food and ag. Just like during the USMCA and the NAFTA negotiations, we don't want ag to get thrown under the bus to government procurement and steel and things of that nature. This is sort of the same thing here, sort of putting it front and center, saying you need to collaborate, you need to work together on labor and, and try to just foster that cross-departmental communication. That's, that supports you know, where we were coming from from that recommendation perspective. Any additional discussion? So, Julie, just 
Uh, Real, this, this is Charles, and you know, I don't, I don't know how. You, I'm, I agree with Julie. I agree with everything that's been said. Labor is by far our biggest issue, but we in the wrong agency to deal with it. We should be in USDOL instead of USD USDA. But and if we want to, and I don't know how you tie these two together. I don't. I really don't think you can. Um, I would say we just advance number seven because and we can advance number six too, but it's really a, to me, even number six is more of a wish list and number seven is more of a, it's a more solid recommendation. It's more reasonable that something that USDA can do. That's kind of my two, my two cents worth. And, and just to sort of reiterate what I've said in the past, which is, I mean, while it's ideal for the committee to put forth recommendations that are specific to USDA programs and services, if you all advance anything, whether it's a recommendation or position statement that has to do with another department, um, what we'll end up doing is just sharing it with the department, but we can't, we can't track and report out the progress. And so yeah. the, the, it just closes from that point. Once we share it, it's, it's complete on our end, which doesn't really, I mean, if you all understand and accept that, thumbs up, but usually you all want to report this as, okay, what actually happened with that recommendation? And in that case, we'll say we shared it with our colleagues. I, I think it's important to have it in, in the record, whether or not it's something that is traceable and can be carried through to a metric, like you're saying, Darrell. Um, I think to have, you know, the, the subcommittee on labor and not at least mention what is the biggest problem in our industry right now <laughs> um, is, is sort of sort of odd, right? So I think we have to take a stance to at least put it into the conversation, um, knowing exactly what you said, Charles. It's almost symbolic, um, but I think it does need to be there because it is such a massive problem. Um, you know, not only to our industry, but, you know, I think across the country and elsewhere, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying we don't advance it. I'm, I no, reckon I was saying number seven is much, much more actionable than number six. Yeah. I think we all agree <laughs> for sure. So I, I think we're moving both. <laughs> let's, let's get ours done. <laughs> Julie, you can step up and be a leader here. Let's show, let's show the other three how to get it. Let's do both. <laughs> okay, great. And so, Julie, um, one, one clarification question for you. I know that during the RMA um, presentation, they specifically wanted to know um, if there was a, a, a um, revenue limit that you all had in mind. Um, when you go back and you're refining, are you planning to include that? And, and if you are, do you need me to do something extra with connecting you to RMA in the background so that they can, if, if, do you need additional insights from RMA on that? Well, and, and, and if, um, you know, subcommittee chime in, um, greater committee chime in. My thought is, is that we take that um, and modify that to say, you know, essentially the, the max limit needs to be, um, uh, needs to be, uh, based on statistical analysis of the, you know, the larger size industry that's not captured here, um, you know, because I, just ha having talked to, um, you know, just a couple people within within the subcommittee themselves, you know, one of the reasons they weren't participating was because this would have been outside of the revenue that, you know, that would have actually helped them. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I certainly haven't seen the data, um, uh, to be able to even ballpark it, you know, you know, right, right. I can throw out $20 million, but that seems ridiculous. You know, that's, that seems like a, like a pie in the sky or, or maybe that's way too low. So, um, I think that's uh, a good that, approach to go with some sort of, um, stat analysis that takes that, that sort of at a high level grabs everyone. So right. I, yeah. I get what you're saying. You get a lot of analysis on those upper tier companies, yeah. Right. 
and, and then I'll also um, retool that number six um, to do some better clarification on that one as well, um, based on that conversation. Yeah, I, okay. I would agree. I, I think it would be irresponsible just to throw out a number. Um, I think the responsible thing to do is to identify that the current limit needs to be evaluated because we know that that is problematic and you really have to wait for the data and what that shows to get to, to, get to whatever that number may be. That, that's my take. I'll retool those and then recirculate that in within our subcommittee. Awesome. I'm going to move to the next food safety. All right. We've had a, a lot of uh, chat and, and text uh, going on amongst our, our subcommittee. Um, I think I'm going to hand it over to uh, David Sherrod uh, and uh, Paul Teague to provide further comment from our subcommittee. Can you hear me? Yes. You can? Yes. Okay. All right, we were, uh, uh, like Kylie said, we are uh, trying to look at uh, some opportunities to do some, uh, to uh, put, put a couple of our uh, recommendations together, uh, just where we can combine and make at least uh, one attempt, uh, first attempt to go uh, through this. So we're actually gonna try to look at uh, number 10 and number nine and number 10. Let me get that in front of me. Uh, where we're actually looking at doing some of the, uh, uh, recommending that the agriculture secretary provide additional funding and um, also um, providing a seat at the table um, let's see, let me read what we said there, Kylie. You might have to chime in on some of this because I'm losing my place here. Um, so on the, any opportunities to protect, we're protecting the domestic producers by one, having a seat at the table for the USDA collaboration during discussions with Mexico, and also combining that with uh, publishing the FSMA Produce Safety Rule Ag Water Standards since domestic and foreign entities need to comply. And we also said that we could also like take a little bit of that about uh, adding some of the improved education and training funding to facilitate compliance. So we're, we're trying to take all three of them and at least come to one uh, unilateral suggestion or recommendation. And that is kind of where we're at right now. So and Kylie, if you got anything to kind of bring that together, it probably is a little bit uh, broken up with me doing it, but uh, please uh, add anything you want to do to that. Well, I'll, I'll let uh, Paul comment and then I can maybe come back on around. And that's Paul Teague from our subcommittee. Ah, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. Um, I agree with what David said, and I think combining them is probably the right thing to do. Um, I, I'm still a little bit disappointed in the number of inspections that we have on imported produce. I think it's woefully inadequate, um, but I, I, really, I, I really like the idea of, of, of more training, especially being a new auditor. Um, you know, the more the better for me at this point. Um, so within uh, the, the subcommittee, uh, I think what we can do is retool into one uh, focus recommendation with some subset breakdown, uh, demonstrating that we want the agricultural secretary to use the following avenues to improve uh, compliance uh, for all entities involved, both foreign and domestic, using the following avenues. And this will help protect consumers as well as our domestic fresh produce supply chain.
that's, that's a lot of debt space. So <laughs> you used we, it well. It usually is a uh, Darrell with food safety. Unfortunately, that's, uh, <laughs> that's where we that's where we end up. Uh, you you do this and you do this, right? Um, but. The, the subcommittee is, is, very, is very focused on making sure that our intent is there to not only protect the consumer, but also protect our domestic supply chain and to use the compliance avenues for improvement. And we believe that the USDA can help with that in policy facilitation. So I'm just... I'll, I'll, add, I'll add to that, Darrell, that, you know, I think that what we need to do is kind of like the other uh, subcommittees is just to get back together and retool this and get that, uh, you know, wrote up the, uh, the correct way as far as combining the three that we've put on the table and getting that back to you in the next uh, couple of days. Yep. And what I can do is I, um, I did a similar thing for the food safety team. I can create a, an, a Zoom account that you all can just get on at any given time without having to deal with my schedule. So you can go into your working session and just hammer it out and meet. My Zoom account can totally be used for that. Um, just on timing, um, Paul, I'm thinking that maybe we request that they are submitted um, by close, close of business on December 3rd. That way, once they're submitted to you and I on the 3rd, um, I think I let me see if we have a, a check-in schedule that day. On Friday. On on the Monday of December 6th, so that we can just sort of go over and make sure everything looks good. Um, Great. Yeah. We could schedule. It's not there now, but we'll put it on there. And then and the idea is that we're done and submitting by the end of the by the end of the year. Yes, exactly. The goal would be that um, once they're submitted to you and I, by the third, we look to make sure that everything looks solid and, and good by the sixth. And then within that week, I'll start routing it through my agency leadership and on up. I mean, great. Um, yeah. the, 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 now, will we have feedback by the end of the month? No, I don't think so because of the holidays being back to back. And so, um, feedback won't probably come until either January or February, just depending on vacation time and in other um, departmental priorities that occupy executives' time. Sounds fine. Sounds great. Excellent. Um, I'm scared that we're, you're, we're about to be finished an hour and 15 minutes ahead of time now that we have that. <laughs> people, people like it when you give them that's the time a, back. That's a good thing, right? It is. Are there any, it's, a sign um, of, it's a sign of efficiency. <laughs> exactly. Is there, are there any um, unresolved inquiries that we sort of need to address as a group? Just want to uh, make sure I put that out there. I know we covered a lot the past two days. All right, I, I think we can shift to closing remarks. Paul, you've got the floor. Close the, you can close out the meeting and adjourn us. Yeah, I mean, my closing remarks are to, to give everyone their time back and to express my gratitude that people got us through this quickly. It wasn't for a lack of care or diligence or thoughtfulness. I thought uh, people contributed all of those things. Um, and, and, and I'm just grateful. Those are, my, those are my only thoughts, Darrell. You've done a great job and I appreciate it. The committee leaders were terrific. And, uh, and I think the recommendations when we're done, we're done with them are going to be fantastic. And, and this process is a good one. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you all. Take care. Thank all right. you, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.